Um, I'm an entrepreneur. And an entrepreneur is somebody who makes money by knowing the future, by predicting the future, right? And today, the theme is about what it's going to be like in 2030. How are you going to make a sustainable future? Three years ago, a medical billing company in the United States came to my company and said, we want to replace our people with software. What can you do? We spent three months reviewing the company, and for a few million dollars, we were able to replace 90% of the workforce with software. What used to take seven days for people to do could be done in only one sixth of a second. And you can imagine profitability went up, efficiency went up, and that's what my company does. In fact, it was so good that our client ended up buying us out for multi million dollars. And this was just this year. What happens when you replace people with software, technology, uh, robots? You know, we're talking about unmanned vehicles and, and cars that drive themselves. In fact, Dubai just launched their unmanned taxi recently. Uh, with humans, work, nobody died. So you don't have to pay them salary. They work on weekends, no office politics, no vacations. It just makes sense. And that is happening now. That's not even the future. The future is way more than that. A few days ago, actually a month ago, uh, anybody heard of the game Go? Go is a thousand times more complicated than chess. And Google's uh, software, which is basically the DeepMind, it's, a, it's a one aspect of DeepMind, it watched people playing Go, figured it out, the game by itself, and beat the world chess, uh, world Go champion, right? So it actually developed intuition to the point that the coders who built that software could not figure out why it was taking the steps that it was taking. So computers and machines are becoming more intelligent than humans. And I use growth hacking and I use automation in all my businesses that I've been part of, invested in, consulted with, and people love me for it. Uh, and we make a lot of money, a lot of profit, right? Very less people, more automation, not more money. Now let's talk about the 10% of the people we couldn't fire. That's what here, what's the topic of tonight. That what skills, what qualities are going to be still viable, still relevant in 2030? That's very important for us to know. Because only when you know the future, you can own the future. It's too late. When you're in the future and you decide, oh my god, everybody's doing it, I should do it too. Like today you're studying engineering. Because there are you know, IT companies that might recruit you, so I should do engineering too, like she mentioned, right? That's what our parents tell us to do. So I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, well, might happen, in, in 2030. So the people, the 10% of the people that we couldn't fire were the relationship managers. So the company was a, was a health, medical healthcare company where it was just billing. And this billing company, they have people who interface with doctors. So the doctors know, they trust, they believe that this company is viable, it's going through and it's going to save them money. So those are the people that you cannot fire. Because that job cannot be done by machines or softwares. It's trust. The doctors don't even know that they're uh, the company they're working with is making so much more money now and people are replacing with software. They don't need to know. Because in the future, human beings will be best at doing what we do best, human-like things. Negotiations, communications, things that deal with the feeling. When the industrial revolution happened, there was a lot of time that was saved. People were able to use machines, the steam engine, all of these things came out and people were like they had a lot of time. Guess what happened? The movie industry came out. The music industry came out. Entertainment became a big business. And as we go down the future, and people have more time, you know, you just swipe on Tinder, you have a date or a hookup, right? You just, everything is at your fingertips. Anything you need is at your fingertips. People will have more time. So we're going to talk about how relationships come to revenue, right? So when people trust you, 
when people like you, when you have a heart-to-heart -heart connection, that's when value is created. As an entrepreneur, it's very important to understand value creation is not always about money making, it's about value creation. My friendship, let's say, with uh, a certain professor today, he treats me nicely, I treat him nicely. You never know, tomorrow he might come up with a patent that I might commercialize and we both make billions of dollars. You just don't know. So that friendship actually has a value, a dollar sign or a rupee sign on it. So any activity you do, any step you take, any decision you make, whether you watch movies or you know, taking drugs or dating someone or building a product, whatever you're doing, it has a value, a negative or a positive, but it has a value to it. Time, value of money. You've got to understand that. And in your 20s, whatever you do decides the rest of your life. So relationships become revenue. So those of you who have not watched my first TED talk, it was called The Currency of Relationship. And that's the story of how I built a million dollar business with no money. I was using the currency of relationship, favors, trust, reputation. And this is how Tata built his business. This is how Ambani built his business. This is how people have always built their businesses. Trust, loyalty, relationships, and monetizing that. That will not change in the future as well. So you better learn that skill right now. In the industrial revolution, people were trying to be made into machines, right? You look at those ladies standing, doing the same thing eight hours a day, eight hours a day. And today, we try to turn machines into humans. What's changing? Where is the world going? We love our phones more than our friends, even though the phones are meant to connect us with our friends, right? So these are things we need to think about. And as human beings, and I'm a big believer in Bhagavad Gita and spiritual background, so we humans, as spiritual beings, as souls, are designed to love and be loved. It's plain and simple. That's why you see all the Bollywood people dancing and the Hollywood people that everybody's looking for love. And it's just not just boy girl love. There's love between pets, love between siblings, love between, you know, all kinds of different flavors of love. But love, nevertheless, love makes the world go round. Now, in a business relationship, this is how I do business. I build relationships, I do a lot of favors. And those of you who follow me on social media, I know a lot of you do. Uh, Probably have seen my quote, give, give, give before making an ask, right? And that's investing in a relationship. And that never changes. For no matter what, as long as we are human beings, that will never change. Even though you might see people absorbed in their phones, right? But what is in that phone? It allows you to connect with another conscious being on the other side of the world or other side of the city. So we find happiness when we connect with somebody who's a conscious being. That's where happiness comes from. If the phone couldn't communicate, how long could you play games? How long could you just do, you know, virtual things, material things? It's the relationship, it's the happiness factor. That's what addicts us to technology. This is from the Srimad Bhagavatam in our Vedic scriptures, which says that Okay, religion, truthfulness, cleanliness, tolerance, mercy, physical strength, and memory will all diminish day by day because of the influence of Kali. We are 5,118 years into the Kali Yuga. And we can see there are a lot of wars being fought over oil, even though we have high fi technology, even though we have a better life, still. The nature of people, the greed of people's minds, are needing to do all kinds of heinous crimes. So as things become better and better, there is going to be deeper needs. So this is the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I want to talk about, anybody heard about Maslow's hierarchy? Right? The bottom part is about physiological needs. So the physiological needs are generally met given technology. Technology can help us meet them food, clothing, sleep, etc, etc, sex, right? But the other part is love and belonging. 
Sex is not intimacy. Tinder gets you a hookup. But a hookup is not as satisfying as a relationship. Right? And everyone, as we understand we're spiritual beings, we're looking for love. We're looking for long-lasting happiness. And that's where the future will demand. Education will evolve. Technology, artificial intelligence, all of those things are going to evolve to make us more human, give us more time so we can have more human-to-human -human interactions. Then we have a quality of life over quantity of life. I have a lot of mentors and friends from millionaires and billionaires. I've been very fortunate to have grown up in Chicago. And these people are not the happiest people. You would imagine they have money, they have the best house and the best cars, and they change their wife every three years. Still, they're not happy. What's missing in their goddamn lives? Right? They have the quantity taken care of, but the quality is lacking, even though they can buy anything. One thing you cannot buy is happiness. And happiness comes from strong, meaningful relationships. When you have technology, and you have money, and everything is taken care of, and fast forwarding 2030, right? I, my business partner just had a baby in two days, her one year uh, birthday. And I was just thinking she's going to be a 13 year old, a teenager by the time 2030. And in that time, in this world, when we have self-driven cars and hyperloops and, and everything taken care of by machines and softwares, guess what? People are going to be bored out of their minds. How many movies can you watch? They're going to feel the failing relationships hurting them. In fact, I have seen online, I cannot vouch for it, but in fact, for, in four years of college education in the United States, 70% of the students, at least once, seriously considered committing suicide. I was one of them. When my parents got separated. And I had no clue how I would fund my education. That's when Bhagavad Gita came in my life. It transformed my consciousness. It touched my heart. It gave, gave me the crown of confidence. It gave me the crown of motivation. That yes, I cannot be stopped because of financial reasons. And in fact, I not only went through my education, but I never worked in a job. I always did business, one after another. Seven businesses in the US, right now running five. Patents in three continents. So, parent separation, no money couldn't stop me. And right now I you know, funded scholarships and whatnot. But that's the story of my life. And that goes to tell you that it's not about material things, it's not about skills, it's not about things, it's not about products and gadgets. It's about us humans learning to be humans. And when you do that, when you do that, magic happens. Do you think the person who gets to buy from that deserves it? There's nobody better than that person? Or persons who get all these big, big awards, they deserve it? No, it's not the best people get it, it's the people you lobby with. If one party is in power, if you have been lobbying with that party for the last five, six years, you're probably going to get that award. Right? Scholarships. Anything in society, it's not a fair world. Deal with it. This is the reality. Just by working hard, you cannot get to the top. Working hard works. But you've got to be smart, you've got to know human relationships, you've got to know how to use the system, how to connect with people, how to be likable. So jobs of the future are less about skills and more about qualities. Because skills will be taken care of by softwares and robots, even parents can do stuff, right? And robots can even, instead of, uh, like softwares can self-replicate, they can build new softwares. It's already happening, it's not even the future, it's happening now. But us humans, we need to know qualities. And qualities lead to high quality of work. It leads to reputation. This is my definition of reputation. Reputation is the repetition of a sustained behavior over a period of time. And if you are performing high quality work, punctual, you know, Indian stressable time, not that, but actually on time, likable, if you are likable, right, she's pretty, 
right? She has been missing Asia Pacific. My business partner told me, well, in that four speakers, she's the second most attractive person. Like, huh, thanks. <laughs> but the reason, yes, and it works. I'm sure things, the doors open up because you're missing Asia Pacific, right? If, you're, if you present the best version of yourself, things work in your favor. You have to be flexible, understand, you're not perfect, nobody else is. So patience, tolerance, care, compassion, very important as a human being. We are humans, we are not machines. Machines cannot do that, that's our advantage over machines. That's how they cannot win over us. Social proof. Everybody's on Facebook, right? You've got to get people to know that you are doing amazing work. A lot of professors, I speak at a lot of universities, and people come to me and professors say, I'm doing this amazing work, but nobody knows about it. My books don't sell. My patents don't commercialize. I'm like, have you told anyone? I don't know who to talk to. I'm like, go on LinkedIn. Put it out. Connect with people. So you've got to be on social media. You've got to go out there and, and get your reputation to make revenue for you. It's like relationships make revenue for you. Your reputation also is monetizable. In fact, people pay me to hire people because I surround myself with smart people. Instead of paying $3,000 to a headhunter, they'll pay me because I have that reputation that I deal with class, not mass.